Evening Vinyl Community, Aris here. Um, doing another video. For three and five days, I've gone mad. It must be uh, the end of lockdown approaching and I'm in a rush to get these things out. Um, it's the 8th today and uh, I was thinking it was the 8th of April that I think all of Britain found out at 9 o'clock, so in a couple of hours, Kurt Cobain had died because uh, they announced it on the news, BBC News. I think it was Jan Leamy. I remember sitting at home, I was waiting for Beavis and Butthead to come on, Channel 4, and it was, and the headline was Kurt Cobain of Nirvana, and there was that second, I thought, I think they're going to announce he's dead, and uh, they did. And my mum rang me, which is really unusual, because uh, my mum rarely rings me, and I rarely ring my mum, but uh, we get on well, but we just don't ring each other, and she rang me and said, Kurt Cobain's died, which is, which was crazy, because... Uh, yeah, it was just a weird time. Um, I, I was, I was a big Nirvana fan almost from the word go. I mean, literally almost from the word go, and uh, it was the first rock star death that kind of um, affected me a bit. Although not too bad. I was sort of going off Nirvana to be honest by, at this stage. But um, yeah, I always tell the story of uh, I went to R Price in 1989, and uh, Nirvana were already getting quite big in the UK because they employed Everett True, who was the main journalist for the Melody Maker to be their publicist because they realised that in England you could break bands really quickly compared to America. So uh, if you bought the weeklies in, in the UK in 89, 88, Sub Pop were getting front covers and all, all kinds of stuff and I went in our price, saw this copy of Bleach, never heard Nirvana, knew I'd like them, I'd already bought albums by Tad and, the, and Mud Honey and uh, Green River and I thought I'll buy this and uh, I've got it home. And it was the white vinyl, and I was I was gutted because I, I hate white vinyl. Tried to take it back. They couldn't take give it to me back because they only had a couple of. There probably weren't that many copies of this in, in in Britain at the time. And they said, "Well, you can't change it." And uh, I had to take it home. And uh, I only paid three pound ninety nine for it as well because I think they thought it was the EP blue because it got a very similar cover. So um, there's four copies of this on discs at the moment going for a th well one's going for a thousand. I think the top's going for about eighteen hundred. There was only 300 of these pressed, and uh, it's the only uh, one of the few albums I actually keep in a sleeve because uh, it will probably be my pension plan. Because uh, due to um, poor financial management, I don't have much of a pension, so I'm hoping this skyrockets. And I did say in a previous video, I went around a record fair once in '95 and tried to flog this for 50 quid, and no one would touch it with a barge pole. I was, I was, I was going through bad times at the time, and I'm so glad. No one touched it or no one bought it off me, but uh, yeah, Bleach. And around that time, uh, I, I joined Sub Pop, Sub Pop Singles Club. I've sold all my single, single club singles uh, about 25 years ago for a ridiculously low price because they go for fortune now. But they sent me the, I've still got this uh, flyer, upcoming tour in 89, Tad with support band Nirvana. Uh, Newcastle Riverside, Manchester Polytechnic. The gig I was meant to go to was Portsmouth Polytechnic. And I didn't go at the time. I don't know, because I don't think it sold out. And I can't remember why I didn't go. I think it was a Thursday night. But, um, yeah, absolutely gutted. Um, and then around the time that uh, Nevermind came out. No. Yeah, around the time Nevermind came out, they started, the first Nirvana bootleg started appearing. And I bought this one, Nirvana Live. I think this is the first ever Nirvana bootleg. I've got a feeling. Um, I bought this, I think about December 91. Um, and it's a gig from the pig, the Blind Pig in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, it's a pretty good bootleg, actually. It's, it's not bad. Um, and the weird thing is, I listened to this a lot when I was young. Uh, it, it, it is pretty listenable to. It's got some great songs on it. Um, stuff that hadn't been released or I hadn't really, I hadn't really heard of. Um, I don't think I owned Molly's Lips at the time uh, or Stain so it had some good songs on it and um, years later I'm on YouTube and, and the gig appeared on YouTube which was kind of disappointing because when you have a bootleg you kind of play the al album you, you play the gig in your mind don't you so to actually see the gig it was kind of disappointing it's, <laughs> I don't know why but uh, yeah this is a really good, good gig I don't know what this would be worth now because obviously they never put price up on disc it's probably not that much but uh, I think this is one of the first Nirvana bootlegs anyway, but uh, yeah, it's decent. Um, 
just before then, I bought. I mean, this these were this was just sitting in HMV. They used to have a little box of seven inch singles, and this is uh, Nirvana's Sliver and Dive. Um, on I think they call this hot pink vinyl, and this was just in a box. I think it's like two pound ninety nine, and I bought this. And uh, I mean, this is this is their greatest seven inch. I think. Or, I mean, Sliver and Dive are both phenomenal. Absolutely love it. And. Uh, Yes, I think it's my only Nirvana 7-inch, and uh, again, I imagine that's worth a couple of quid now, but uh, yeah, fantastic. And then Hole, of course, I used to have the, the first Hole album on coloured vinyl, but uh, yeah, that, that, that went in the big sell-off of uh, 2003. Um, but I've still got a 7-inch, and there's Beautiful Sun by Hole with a picture of Kurt on the front. And it's a really great, really great song, and I, I do quite like Early Hole. Especially, especially Burn Black, which I think is one of their great singles of all time. Um, well, I think it's a B-side actually, but yeah. Um, Beautiful Sun by Hull, really great little single. And this one's uh, another one, another one on pink vinyl. Um, I think I've shown this before. I think I've cut this came out about December 92. Um, Nirvana, Incesticide, this is, this, to me, this is the absolute glory years of Nirvana. That, period between Bleach and ne Nevermind, um, Dive, Sliver, Stain, Bean of Sun, Turn Around, Molly's Lip, Son of a Gun, New Wave, Polly, absolutely brilliant. Um, side 2 just falls apart, it's just, um, they're sort of Led Zeppelin riffing and there's some nonsense, but it does then contain what I think is the greatest Nirvana song from that sort of second phase, which is Anarusium, which is absolutely fantastic, wish they'd put that on uh, Nevermind. But absolutely cracking album this and uh, of course the big one which I didn't buy this is a this is a this is a repress because when Nevermind came out I used to buy pretty much anything in the enemy and Melody Maker that was album of the week on the Monday so I, I went I dashed out looking for uh, Nevermind and was really confused because I couldn't find it anywhere and considering it was on a it was on a major label I, I couldn't get my head around it but of course they expected the album to sell maybe a couple of hundred thousand worldwide. So they only shipped 50,000 vinyl copies to the whole of Europe. So I couldn't get it. So I had to buy a, a repress. But I've got to say, I've heard the original. The repress actually probably sounds better because the original came out in 91 where they really were trying to dissuade people buying vinyl in those days because obviously they were making a killing on CDs at £15.99 a pop. And let's face it, CDs were cheaper to uh, produce than... Uh, than vinyl albums as well, which they were selling for about seven ninety nine a pop at the time. But uh, yeah, this repress is uh, pretty decent actually. And of course, the final, the payoff in utero. And um, yeah, I was never a big fan of in utero. I thought it was a bit of a cop out actually. I think they could have gone two ways. One, they could have uh, gone absolutely hyper pop and just produced an amazing power pop record like Anarusium or something like that. Or they could have gone totally noisy and produced like a butthole surfers, locus of Borson technician, something like that, complete noise record. And, and to me, this fell in between two stools. Um, wasn't a massive fan of In Utero, never have been. Uh, again, this is a repress. I bought the CD of that at the time and uh, the CD sounded appalling, um, totally underpowered. But again, the final copy is pretty decent. And of course also, which I haven't bothered to Look out, it was uh, un Unplugged, which I think everyone admits or will say is, is probably one of their finest moments. Um, brilliant. But uh, yeah, I just thought I'd put a, a little tribute to Kurt up, because I say it's 27 years in two hours' time that I learnt of his death, and he was 27 years old, and uh, it seems unbelievable, doesn't it, in the pre-internet age, that he died on the 5th, but you didn't hear about it to the 8th. That just wouldn't be possible now, would it? It's absolutely incredible. But uh, yeah, that's my... Uh, little collection of Nirvana records and uh, I'm sure I'll be doing some other videos soon. Cheers, thank you.